So we'll leave one. Bienvenue. Welcome to the third John Thompson Lecture on Academic Freedom. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional unceded territory of Wollastowig. This territory is covered by the P Treaties of Peace and Friendship, which the Wollastowig, Mi'kmaq, and Pestamakati first signed with the British Crown in 1725. The treaties did not deal with the surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized the Wollastowig, Mi'kmaq, and Pestamakati title and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. So, for many of us here at UMB, academic or collegial governance is top of mind these days in a million small ways and in many big, one, big ones, uh, many of us feel that it is under threat. It is highly significant that recently an external consultant, KPMG, produced an organizational chart, chart that outlines recommended administrative structures at UMB, placing the Board of Governors above a hierarchy of center, senior administrators with no signs of senates and faculty councils. This representation is mirrored in the diagrams on our own administrative, uh, administration's website, where the Board of Governors informs the President and Vice Chancellor and the University Secretary directly in heavy dark lines, while Senates are only linked only to the University Secretary in, and only by dashed lines. These simple diagrams uh, map uh, in, in, in very interesting and uh, alarmingly decollegialized, uh, decollegialized, there's a word I just made up, uh, vision of governance, uh, and one that I think many of us find quite alarming. So it, it's in this context that we are so very glad to have Dr. Len Finley come today to share with us his insights on university governance in the 21st century. Uh, Len Finley is a distinguished university professor, director of the Humanities Research Unit and founding member of the Indigenous Humanities Group at the University of Saskatchewan, and the past president of the Academy One Arts and Science, uh, Arts and Humanities of the Royal Society of Canada. He is also a senior fellow at the Centre for Free Expression at Ryerson, and a member of the Board of Directors of the Harry Crow Foundation. He served for almost a decade on the Academic Freedom and Tenure Committee of the Canadian Association of University Teachers, uh, including two terms as chair, and he is past chair of the University of Saskatchewan Faculty Association. Len Finley is a staunch advocate for radical humanities, a sharp critic of the contemporary university, and a steadfast defender of academic freedom. As you will hear, he makes a compelling case for the fundamental interconnection between scholarly activity and union activity, as is evident from his interdisciplinary and engaged approach to academic work. He has explored the social functions of the literary, the figure of the public intellectual, the role of institutions and disciplines in determining what counts as knowledge and culture, and the division of academic labor in the contemporary university. He is currently endeavoring to establish a number of different, in a number of different settings how critical theory combined with critical pedagogy and collaborative research can help decolonize Canadian universities while repoliticizing them in ways more receptive to the needs and knowledge of different communities. And I think these very broad interdisciplinary perspectives on universities and community and, and the notion of the collegium are, are central issues and central ones that um, this perspective can help, uh, help us sort through. So uh, with this in mind, please join me in extending a warm welcome to Len Finley. Well, thank you for uh, uh, being here this evening, everyone. And thank you for that uh, specific and uh, historically grounded acknowledgement of the first peoples of, uh, 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 of, this, of this territory. It's a very important acknowledgement and uh, uh, has to be much more than pro forma, I think, and uh, as we all try to indigenize our institutions. Uh, further to that acknowledgement, I'd also like to acknowledge the, uh, uh, my brothers and sisters in the uh, union uh, at UNB. Uh, they have been wonderful hosts. It was a very kind invitation, uh, and I was uh, uh, very glad to, to accept it. 
I'd also like to acknowledge up front the extraordinary accomplishments of the person uh, in whose name these lectures uh, uh, unfold. Uh, John Thompson is a national treasure. He is every student and scholar in Canada is in John Thompson's debt now and in the conceivable future. John would be far too, is far too modest to ever uh, make that claim, but that claim is made on his behalf by a wide variety of colleagues all across this country. Uh, I'm proud to, to know him and, and think of him as my friend and uh, uh, in uh, uh, common projects, and I think that uh, you should all be especially proud of him too. I'm also proud to be uh, speaking uh, after uh, Susan Drummond, who spoke last year as the lecturer in this uh, uh, series. Uh, I've never met Susan Drummond, a uh, legal scholar at Osgood uh, Hall, uh, but I was, I was uh, one of the readers for the University of Toronto Press uh, when her uh, book manuscript uh, wa was developed. Uh, after the highly controversial two-state uh, 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 possibility conference between Queens uh, and York uh, several years ago. Uh, I gave that manuscript a, a, a resounding accolade and prospect and urged UTP uh, to pull its socks up and get it out as soon as possible. You can imagine my consternation when very late in the day that manuscript was pulled from publication at the University of Toronto Press and it, that, that event uh, occasioned a, a kind of interaction between Susan and I. Uh, at the, happily, uh, the editor at UBC Press contacted me and said, Len, would you, could we use at UBC Press your assessment of, that, of, of, of Susan's work? And I was, I was happy to comply. And that book came out and I think is a very important uh, a contribution to the nuanced and complicated uh, set of uh, inquiries, uh, uh, invitations and resistances uh, that uh, define the academic freedom uh, con uh, uh, conversation in Canada. So let's see if we can get all of this working. So collegial governance in the 21st century, my subtitle is Serving the Curious Collegium or an Obedience Machine. Uh, this is a typical, deliberately stark opposition on my part. I mean curiosity in two senses, uh, the sense of being curious and sui generis and curious and in being inquisitive. Or obedience is the only route for teacher scholars beyond academic precarity. In other words, the university is an anomalous entity within current regimes of ownership, prescriptive targets, and work. But its anomalous, curious structure and values remain inseparable from the curiosity and indeterminacy fundamental to the university's proper functioning. Meanwhile, recourse to precarious academic labor in tandem with overbearing instrumentalities of the hour, strive to enforce a new academic normal as what the market demands and what the market must have. So I'll have a look, I'll look at the broad trend in academic governance as I understand it, the non-identity of institutional autonomy and academic freedom and what that may enable or imperil I'll look at who governs the allegedly self-governing. Uh, I will comment on the University of Calgary at the present moment. Plus, I'll use two historical and I think still very current examples from Manitoba and from this university, from UNB, uh, in order to uh, add some uh, allure to my case. Uh, I'll then have a look at the hazards and delusions of planning in the managed university. Uh, where shared governance and, uh, or shared services in what one might call the Uberized economy uh, that is TTI and KPMG are bringing your way only too soon. 
And then I'll suggest that uh, there is a better model than, than that, and perhaps the TRC calls to action is the way to interpolate our institutions at this moment. So the broad trend in academic governance. Uh, the first shift, I think, was from presidential autocracy with the duff Berdal report in 1966, a joint CAUT AUCC endeavor, Imagine that today, uh, affirming shared, go shared governance and academic control of the academic agenda within the frame of relative autonomy in the service of academic freedom. A lesson too easily lost here is that difference of analysis, interpretation, and interest are not irritations to be avoided or assuaged at all costs. Difference constitutes the field of shared governance. So the only surprise occurs when it seems absent or fully resolved. And this is intimately connected to the broader context in which diversity is viewed as enrichment appropriate to the field or contamination, impurity, inefficiency, and hark what discord follows that. Second phase then, after Berdal, Duff Berdal, what we see is the rise of academic managerialism, bureaucratic bloat, the consultancy paradox, outsourcing expertise and responsibility at great cost and to little effect and that most damaging, mostly damaging. And the rise of Big Brander, and believe me, Big Brander is indeed watching you. All of this in an effort to define, unilaterally govern, and to claim to speak for the university in spite of Dorf Berdo. The, cons the, consulta the con consultancy paradox, by the way, is a simultaneous growth of internal uh, administrat admin the administration cohort while at the same time uh, showing increasing dependency on external con uh, 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 consultants. The idea that you are growing the, the administrative uh, administration complement uh, would lead one to infer that you're growing in-house capacity to research and make policy decisions. But if at the same time you're punting responsibility uh, at considerable cost outside the university, then it seems as though uh, there is a problem there, a problem of uh, overlap, a problem of redundancy, a problem of uh, a delegation outside the autonomous institution of the, uh, uh, the need to, uh, in fact, uh, uh, improve its policies. At this time and in this process, we've seen the decline of the faculty share in shared governance. And we've seen also, as a result of that diminishment, the, the turn to unionization as the best hope for academic control of the academic agenda and the academic mission, which is often, uh, I think, uh, uh, available in a pedestrian or implausibly hubristic uh, way in uh, university mission statements. Uh, which I've studied for years and years, and believe that the earliest ones, and most of them indeed, were scripted by the same person who wrote the introduction to Star Trek. <laughs> well, what are the pretexts for growth in academic management? They are, there are three, and they come from uh, remarks in the Duff Berdal report. The first is uh, uh, the argument for ac the growth in academic management is institutional size. Universities grow ever larger. Then there is the pointing to institutional complexity as more and more entities subdivide, divorce or arrive for the first time, while funding sources diversify across private alternatives to a volatile, uncertain provincial and tri-council scene. And then there is the onus of accountability for public funding, which increases according to various arguably adequate formula, while dependency on the tuition revenue stream increases ever more. 
Each of these three, size, complexity, accountability, each of these three has been used to excuse the shifting of resources disproportionately away from the university's core mission and those who best understand and fulfill it. Notice that we need such people. I am not arguing that there shouldn't be such people. I'm arguing there has been a disproportionate shift of uh, uh, resources in order to accommodate uh, an administration uh, expansion that is not only not beneficial, but in my view, in certain respects, profoundly damaging to the nature and the future and the functionality of the university. So, if you're having size, complexity, and accountability, fine. But institutional size should be a shared determination, responsibly arrived at, rather than opportunistically inflated and globally harvested in the wake of old growth internationalism. By old growth internationalism, I point to the international connections and relationships that people have over the years developed rather than what we had after the clear cut, which is uh, uh, international uh, recruitment, uh, which has alarmingly homogeneous uh, aspects to it in terms of its source, and the streaming into Canadian universities dependent in those, on those tuition revenues of students who are not interested in the Canadian university in its diversity, but only in highly targeted areas. So that, that the dependency on that rev revenue stream means the resources flow in there and there is alarming immiseration of all sorts of other parts of the university in which international students have very little interest at all. So there is the, the old growth internationalism being uh, supplanted uh, by very targeted kind of recruitment. There's, they are, if, there, if, if these are complex questions, well, bring it on. Complexity is our bread and butter. We can deal with this. And we also have to, in terms of uh, the accountability for public funding, uh, there we, we should believe, believe, uh, and be seen to believe in making the case for public funding and make it our job not only our, uh, our president's job, but everyone's job to make the case compellingly for public reinvestment in a uh, invaluably public institution, an invaluably public um, uh, system. So on this question of the, of the uh, emergence of the, uh, uh, of the managerial university, uh, I give an example of, of symptomatic discipleship uh, of Peter McKinnon, former president of the University of Saskatchewan, to the work of George Keller. Uh, Keller's work is a, is a Bible of sorts, uh, certainly superior, uh, how could it not be, to the work of Robert T. Dickinson. Uh, so Keller's academic strategy, the management revolution in American higher education, uh, confirmed and helped accelerate the displacement of human reason and imagination as a multidisciplinary array grounded in but not confined by uh, tradition, but the displacement of that by the notion of scientific management. And in uh, McKinnon's uh, uh, book, uh, University Leadership and Public Policy in the 21st Century, A President's Perspective, uh, produced uh, over uh, two years of leave, paid leave uh, after he had left the university, not as a smoking ruin, but uh, certainly in considerable difficulties. Uh, in the middle of that book, you find this, that the, and, and the, the shift to this new managerial uh, model. Decisions to spend money or invite the board to spend money would not be made by the president's executive at Monday morning meetings. They would have been made within the discipline of the integrated planning process. Uh, I've added the emphasis, but the idiocy is his. Uh, if one looks at this uh, uh, a little more closely, the implication, the, the, there's no faculty in this scene of decision making. Uh, you go from an alternative, which is the president's executive meeting in a Monday morning, 
to what is called the discipline of the integrated planning process. Now, what's very important there is the colonizing of the notion of discipline. The notion of discipline is that array of different disciplines that define the university in its traditional diversity and its, uh, its innovating phases. But when discipline moves from the disciplines to the managerial process of controlling and resourcing those differences, uh, those disciplines, it is a moment, I think, of uh, 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 real ominousness. And um, what Peter McKinnon was doing uh, was being done all across the country with various uh, uh, degrees of incompetence. So, and wh what comes out of this is a very important uh, uh, development. The more the administration wins in scientifically managing, that is controlling, uh, the composition and decision of senates, the more they lose as academic stewardship, le uh, uh, legitimacy, and credibility migrate from the ostensibly open and deliberative collegial bodies like senate to collective bargaining processes. In face of this migration, corporate trends and executive compensation split and sunder the collegium while resentment replaces trust and the productively fraught collaboration of faculty, student representatives, and administrators in a largely elected body. Meanwhile, corporate attitudes towards organ organized labor refigure unionizing and unionized academic st staff, not as the university, but as the problem. So we get a shift from presumed gentility uh, under pre-Duff Berdal, uh, male gentility for the most part, to a new academic sociability. It's a sociability in which institutional leaders prefer the company of their team and their fellow CEOs in the private sector to sharing governance with their academic staff. The latest managerial doctrine and buzzword is presented and swallowed by presidents at Montebello or Lake Louise or at the Laurel Point in Victoria, while the Canadian Association of University Business Officers reinforces its sense that the faculty, and I'm quoting from uh, uh, insights shared with me, uh, whether I wanted to hear them or not, reinforces the sense that faculty need to knuckle under and get real. Ergo, collegiality is reduced to congeniality and compliance or else in situations of uh, intensifying intimidation and recrimination. So shunning, cold shoulder, an admonition in your ear, and coded bemusement and disappointment are fre frequent experiences for unhelpful people like me. I've been described by the university president in Minneapolis airport to my next door neighbor in the, when he didn't know who he was talking to as the university's greatest enemy. I, I consider that a considerable plaudit myself. Uh, I've also been described by a VP as the university's most toxic asset and also by my dean as a reputational deficit. Um, and I'm sure you could share in that, uh, you know, the, 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 the hopper of malediction directed by administrators at inconvenient faculty uh, is large, and I'm sure you could add to it uh, uh, quite conspicuously. But administrative insularity and unilateralism breed resistance too. The gentility deficit of which they complain is disputed and dismissed by many faculty as one of the many inappropriate measures and metrics prominent or persistent in zombie planning by the academic undead. So please forgive the temperance of my language there uh, uh, and the understatement that is at its heart. But the point is that planning has become epidemic. It is constantly changing all the time. It keeps faculty permanently off balance. Uh, and it is not about the outcome of the plan. The meaning of uh, ultra-managerial academic planning 
The meaning is compliance. The meaning is not amelioration. The meaning is not improvement. The meaning is not a set of goals uh, 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 subtly and appropriately uh, identified and achieved with varying degrees of difficulty. The idea is complying with the demand uh, for the new demand for justification, the new petition for resources. The idea is you have to obey. It's part of the functionality of what I call the obedience machine. So faculty alienation and despair become more marked among teachers, scholars, termed by one leading consultant. I think it's Alex Usher, but I don't know for for sure, because the person who told me this uh, uh, wouldn't admit to who, who the source was. But the, this consultant said to this leading university administrator, the problem with uh, uh, Canadian academics is they're tired and entitled. Well, tired we get, right? Uh, we're tired not only in the forms of racking physical fatigue, we're tired of being both abused and demonized at the same time. Uh, we won't take it anymore. So we're tired in that sense. But entitled? I'm not so sure about that. I think people have internalized the conditions of their immiseration, certainly. Uh, but, there are, but they're also feeling uh, undervalued and unfairly demonized in all sorts of ways. But as part of this process of the shift from the collegium to the union, uh, from the bylaws and statutes of, 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 the, of the Senate uh, to the four corners of the collective agreement, one of the things that happens with this is that the collective agreement then becomes an aspirational as well as an operational document. Uh, and it becomes one of the appropriate and increasingly necessary sites of ongoing struggle for the soul of the university, as I would say. Resistance builds the 2008 CAUT task force on governance, the shift from collegium to union and to collective agreement language as the first keys to academic integrity when they were held separately from them uh, for a long time. With that happens the sharing of best practices among academic locals across Canada and increases in certification of academic staff associations and goes on apace. And all of this happens during the Harper decade with its double-edged gift to the academy. On the one hand, we have the sorry spectacle of what I call the silence of the shams. During the major assault, muzzling and menacing of public scientists in Canada, anti-evidentiary incursions of all sorts, uh, an open contempt, uh, a man called Gary Goodyear as the minister responsible for Canadian uh, uh, universities, uh, the whole array of ignorance and belligerence masquerading as federal policy while the, tri the, the granting councils are stacked with people who are dark instrumentalists at best and open enemies of knowledge at worst. I could go on. Uh, but let me say that in that situation, what was as striking was that with one or two admirable exceptions, Canada's university presidents were entirely uh, silent and a lot of VP's research were silent too as that open assault on Canadian universities played out. Ergo, silence of the shams. Uh, but not everybody was, was, was silent. And during this period, AUCC brought out its uh, uh, new statement on academic freedom, diminished, constrained, uh, particularly hostile to uh, uh, critique, uh, to speech beyond disciplinary expertise, all of those kinds of things. Uh, and, and, and that document is, ha, bears the, the, the tonality and the temper uh, of the Harper decade, the new statement on academic freedom. And I would ar urge you to look at the, the, the exchanges between uh, Stephen Toop and Paul Davidson and Jim Turk and, and Wayne Peters uh, and on campuses across the country. Uh, the, that is that administration was going in one direction, 
faculty were going in, in another direction as Duff Birdall was replayed and exacerbated in the context and on the theme of academic freedom. freedom. Meanwhile, the inspiring role of CAUT and of principal presidents like David Naylor, still a key ally, it's no coincidence that David Naylor, when he was president of the University of Toronto, refused to sign the, on to the new AUCC statement. And it is him who has been praising CAUT for not being silent during the Harper decade and making a deliberate and effective public advocacy for uh, uh, getting science right, Canada's past matters, and the, the, the value and vulnerability of what is a, a, a post-secondary uh, system uh, admired across Canada and rightly admired across the world. That, that uh, David Naylor came to CAUT Council in the spring, uh, started off with a, a rather disingenuous disavowal, introduced himself as a, a simple country doctor. Well, he's a little more than that. He's an enormously accomplished person. But the, one of the first things he did was a, a shout out to CAUT. And the implication of that shout out was who had been silent during that decade. And who had been silent during that decade were the people who should have been the most uh, vocal advocates for the endangerment of the academy by a particularly hostile federal government. So, emboldened by federal autocracy and its impatient, truculent instrumentalism and silencing, and taking particular cues from local politics and business, and from leadership gurus and HR hawks, senior administrators ratify at this time and implement the shift from the liberal arts to the neoliberal arts, from fractious you, as it's supposed to be, to fracked you. I almost said the F word in another kind of way, uh, but that would cover the realities too. And in this process, the, the economy in its neoliberal understanding and configuration imprints itself more fully on the university with the eager connivance of those who purport to represent, speak for, and defend universities. And at the same time, we return to this question, which remains, I think, this feature that remains true, that institutional autonomy is there to serve academic freedom. Institutional autonomy is not academic freedom. Their overlapping non-identity keeps open always an institutional space for collegial governance as either deliberative, peer-driven autonomy or as an alibi or mask for heteronomy, for the idea of the institution's subordination to external forces. And the question then and still now is which will it be? CAUT's understanding of academic freedom our University of Canada's uh, understanding of academic freedom. And where does that leave collegial governance now? It leaves it in a conjunctural space between enforced, fetishized civility on the one hand, see the freedom of expression draft from UBC at the moment, or Jared Peterson, the ultimate academic narcissus at the U of T, uh, or uh, the, the travails of Dalhousie, uh, all, all of these. And out as well as this, there is voracious capital and the post-secondary education sectoral conflict, uh, as in the current uh, labour dispute in the Ontario college system. According to Dawn Sinclair, CEO of the College Employer Council, Quote, uh, and this is from Simona Hughes's uh, piece in the Globe and Mail about the strike, or uh, one of them. It is not appropriate for one group to have power and control over the core business of your institution. Even universities are being asked to be more responsive, and they can't. They have to work through their senates, and we can't afford to be that slow. So much for the embrace of fast capital, casualized labor, unshared governments, market nimbleness by academic leaders in other parts of the post-secondary education sector, 
where we also have, it's important to add, allies and many of our graduates and S12 colleagues teach. But notice that even Sinclair still expects that universities will be working through their senates for change of any significance. It's an interesting lingering presumption on his part, obviously uninformed by the reality of the co-optation of collegial governments in too many places across the country. So what do you do with this? I don't want to uh, go into this particular question of the academic and unconscious very much here, except to suggest that, that, that Austerity is at the heart of the unconscious, and austerity is reasons other and neoliberalism's accomplice. So what we need to do is map campuses as uh, aspirational havens and the deceptive terrain of contradiction whose signage boasts of sovereignty, autonomy, whose communities are, are uh, increasingly conscripted or prescribed, and whose external relations are timorous and psychophantic. So the university performs the contradiction of being internally autocratic and externally supine. In both regards, flying in the face of the Duff Birdle and all uh, report and all the work of local associations and CAUT. So how about a history refresher? Uh, first from Manitoba, just before the Harry Crow affair, and then from what I've been uh, urged to describe as the Strax Mackay affair at the University of New Brunswick. So here's one of my favorite cartoons. This is from the Manitoba Commonwealth, a CCF for uh, the publication, June of 1947. I'm not sure if you can recognize anybody in the picture or project anyone in there, uh, but you can see uh, that uh, a process is underway uh, which has been uh, marvelously captured. It, it involves Canadian universities, moneyed interests, and the Safe Toys Company. So having pointed to that, owning the means of academic production in 1947, a top-hatted tycoon acts like the anti-intellectual precursor of today's more discreetly directive donors. His strong-arming, rather than arm's-length incarnation of moneyed interests, spurns in disinterested inquiry for the ultra-instrumental assembly line production of safe toys who wear, not the uniforms of war veterans, demanding a less safe education for a more just city street, but instead the ceremonial guard, uh, garb of standardized white male tools of capital, while dollar bills transform into academic scrip, that is diplomas, with every crank of the university's obedience machine. So we have own ownership in its moment. The moment of this cartoon is one of re-emerging re-emergent post-war socialism, looking for a more democratic and open academy with the Harry Crow uh, uh, event just around the corner, and looking for a more inclusive understanding of public systems and the public interest in what soon becomes Cold War Canada. The unidentified cartoonist here, in fact, Harry Gutkin, who has a, a wonderful, wonderful career uh, as, a, as, as a cartoonist and, and a, a, a curator of political cartoons uh, across Europe and North America in, in the 40s uh, and 50s. So Harry Gutkin, the cartoonist fears reinscription of big business agendas and academic tailorism after a global crisis, namely World War II, as well as implying a reimagining of the public university and its products to replace the dominant economic order in its overly contented civics. But this left critique of an acad academy captive to cap capital and management science in 1947 is as relevant today as it was then, or perhaps even more relevant given the agility, self-belief, and crisis management capacities of neoliberals. Here I would simply reference CAUT's invaluable, but too often disregarded, open for business on what terms, a study of 
12 case studies in, in 2013. And also my experience investigating with two colleagues for the past year and a half, the Enbridge Center for Corporate Sustainability at the University of Calgary. At the uh, BC uh, event on university governance in the 21st century uh, in, Mar in March of this year, one of, my, one of my slides in my presentation said, my personal view, without precedent or prejudice, of the public record in the Calgary case is damning. The next slide went as follows. My takeaways from the uh, uh, Enbridge Centre at the University uh, of Calgary uh, are these. It is worse than we thought. I made an error there. I made an error in using we without consulting my co-investigators. Uh, it was too alarmingly close to a royal we, I think, and it was, it was one of several mistakes I made at, uh, at, uh, in, in this event at this point. I also said, I thought uncontroversially, institutional leadership can be fraudulent and imperious. In my even-handed way, I added, the collegium can be both spineless and merely careerist. Digging my hole ever deeper, I guess. And then that CAT's fight with heteronomy means it is reviled and feared by pseudo-autonomists. The immediate fallout from the VC event. I'm asked by a conference organizer if they can post my slides to the website. And I agree, as is my custom. A few weeks later, April 18th, comes a copy of a letter sent to the U of Calgary community and to CEUT from the chair of the Board of Governors uh, of the University of Calgary, Gord Ritchie, Mr. RBC and Oil and Gas. It's not his official title, but I'm just giving it anyway as, a, as an honorific. Uh, chair of the Board of Governors, claiming apprehension of bias on my part as chair of the investigative committee and arguing that this offers even more reason than hitherto to dismiss out of hand the CAUT's committee's work. I recuse myself from the committee, even though the work is largely done and a copy of the draft report in the hands actually or almost of the parties for comment. And I decide to hold fire on the piffle and bluster directed at me and CAUT and my co-investigators by implication, so that the report can be reviewed and revised in my absence and all the pro, pro bono effort, hopefully, will, won't go for naught. When one thinks more about it, though, as I have somehow felt compelled to do, a couple of deliberately personalized slides in an academic uh, union conference presentation were either captured surreptitiously on a phone at the time or discovered by a brand sleuth uh, on the website and relayed to the top brass and board at the University of Calgary. Here, it seems, uh, appeared to them a golden opportunity for yet another preemptive strike against an investigation by CAUT. Other attempts uh, by them are described in the published report, which I urge you to read. They lacked context, uh, the context I provided for the slides in Vancouver. It may or may not have been relying on a biased informant. I have my suspicions, but they're merely suspicions. But they went after me anyway, big time, sending a message to their own faculty as well as to faculty across Canada about who really calls the shots in Canadian universities. There are possible sequels. The, the Enbridge Centre is on the agenda at CAUT Council a week or so from now. The investigation itself may uh, continue. And I'll be at CAUT as an individual member on my own dime to monitor discussions, to sincerely thank, if I am permitted, my co-investigators who did much additional work to bring this ship to harbour, and to look my colleagues from the University of Calgary Faculty Association in the eye. I have job security and a taste for the undeterrable, 
and I'm more than ready for the next phase of my critique of what I and a number of others deem to be serious governance problems at the University of Calgary. But what if I were a junior faculty member or on a, contractual, or on a contractually limited appointment? In light of what I have just told you, how many of you would accept an invitation to serve in such a capacity for CAUT? So this is not about me, this is about you, this is about our students, this is about the public interest, and this is about the soul of academe. And my, my takeaway is after accusation, recusal, and the completion and publication of the report are these. Big oil has its own antennae, board members, and academic apologists. Big oil governs to get its way and imperils academic governance on the, on the way. Big Oil thinks its donations abundantly clear in the 1,200 pages of email that was our primary archive for our investigation. Big Oil thinks its donations are buying academic alibis and a social license for its projects. Think, for example, of the consequences of Standing Rock at the University of North Dakota, where indigenous journalist Mark Terhant, Shoshone Bannock from Idaho, quit after the university administration prevented his teaching two courses on professional and social media responses to the Standing Rock resistance to the Dakota Access Pipeline. Meanwhile, Trump has, has appointed Scott Pruitt, uh, Fox Among the Chickens, to lead the uh, Environmental Protection Agency, and American exceptionalism extends to climate change. I'll try and cheer you up in a minute. <laughs> well, let's take a second historical example. This one, Peter C. Kent's Inventing Academic Freedom, the 1968 Strax Affair at the University of New Brunswick. Uh, I'm going to put up in a moment a photo of Colin Mackay on his appointment as president in 1953 with a telling background that, ins that insists, I think, that Kent's book is mistitled. Uh, it, if you called it the, an attempt to reinvent academic freedom, uh, that might be a, a little closer uh, to it. But the idea of inventing academic freedom in 1968 is an alarmingly ahistorical claim, and uh, the problems don't end there. Uh, so on the, what you're about to see, there will be two beavers flanking the university motto and I will be unrelenting in my investigation of the implications of that arrangement. Uh, the beavers are, in heraldic terms, uh, when animals are used as supporters uh, uh, in this way, they're supposed to be supporters uh, in, in, in conformity with their animal capacities. And so the beavers have to be looked at as as rampant as possible. That's a technical description, uh, and you can read symbolically into that in any way you care to. Uh, so, so as well as wondering about the specific contribution of Castor Canadiensis to, in this context, we may also wonder how the motto is understood, if it is understood at all, and by whom. So there is the amazingly young president. I, I apologize for the the pinkish hue, it's my socialist uh, uh, prejudices shining through here. But there he is, and above, above him are the two supporting beavers and uh, the university's motto, uh, Sapere Aude. So we have Horace, Immanuel Kant, and uh, Colin McKay, all there configured around the reality of Beaver Brook Hill, if you can put it that way. So the idea is, and, and the illusion behind this from, from Horace, is he who has begun is half done, dare to know, sapere, sapere aude. I won't go into that. Uh. So sapere aude in the modern context from Immanuel Kant's famous essay, uh, Vasister Klerung, What is Enlightenment, 1784, the year before the proposed founding of UNB. Uh, Kant's text begins, Enlightenment is man's emergence from his self-imposed immaturity, 
This knowledge is self-imposed if its cause lies not in lack of understanding, but in indecision and lack of courage to use one's own mind without another's guidance. Dare to know, sapere audi, is therefore the motto of the Enlightenment. These are still the stakes today, I would argue. The term like globalization or austerity or whatever, or enlightenment that defines an epoch must be debated, not defined and imposed from above or outside. The problem is not intellectual capacity, but decisiveness and courage. Maturity is, uh, is the translation of Kant's Mundigkeit, and that's tied to Mund, to expression, to the, uh, the, 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 uh, the connection between uh, speaking up, speaking out, writing out, communicating, breaking silence in the interests of the integrity of the enterprise of inquiry and effective dissemination of knowledge. So one of the things I would uh, 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 recommend is that the next meeting of the Board of Governors of the University of New Brunswick, uh, that somebody, uh, goes, some brave soul goes in and says uh, to ask the members of the board what the motto of the university is. Uh, in, after the ensuing long pause, uh, the question then is, what does this mean, literally? And the, sec the, the further question is, what does the proposition sapere audi mean in the history of the evolution of the modern research university and the rise of academic freedom as its most significant and invaluable property for universities in democratic societies? And I'm sure you've got an absolute avalanche of nuanced and formed and entirely convincing responses from members of the board. I think you should also, uh, in, in, as a little pedagogical experiment in the fall, do what I do when I meet first year students for the first time at the University of Saskatchewan. I put up a slide with two mottos on it. One is Deo et Patriae, the motto of the University of Saskatchewan. The other is we sell for less. The students uh, in, in, invariably recognize the Walmart as a, a, a testimony to the total commercial penetration of Canadian academic life, uh, but they never recognize or rarely recognize what Deo et Patriae. So the idea is, that, and then ask your colleagues too, what's the university's motto? Does it matter or is it simply out there? Uh, does it matter? Do we live up to it? Do we live, do we subvert it? Do we empty it of its, of its historical nuances, its historical burden, the burden it places on us as scholars to speak out, to speak emphatically, to break the silences that threaten to break us too? So appealing to autonomous institutions, I suggest uh, not in uh, uh, commercial uh, and uh, con uh, conditional and coercive ways, but appealing to institutions and the key of justice. Harry Gutkin's cartoon did so by exposing the post-war farce of institutional autonomy and by urging universities to work for social and economic justice. And I would argue it's similarly the case with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's uh, calls to action. So if we're going to interpolate uh, universities from the outside in a good way, I think that the, the TRC calls to action are a wonderful model. They emanate from evidence, after Harper, of course, and supported at least rhetorically by Justin Trudeau, by several of its key ministers, and by uh, uh, Governor General Julie, Julie Payette. Emanating also from the critical internationalism of the domestically inherited United Nations De Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It is very instructive, it is salient indeed, that the, in Canada 150, at this particular historical uh, moment of collective national reimagining, it is very, it's very uh, 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 significant that the role of John Humphrey of Miguel 
in the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a very important and proud part of the national story, is heeded and is connected, I think, quite rightly, to then to uh, Lester Pearson and the award of the Nobel Prize. The idea that Canada had as a, a, a multilateralist mid middle power and honest broker a important contribution to make to the, what uh, Christian Friedland talks about as, the, as the, the, econom the, econ the international economic order that has kept us all together, that has kept most of us relatively safe. So that Canada's place in that and the, and the development of that international document with all its sways of force uh, is a thing to be proud of indeed. Nothing is said about Canada's indigenous drafters and architects of the United, the, the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which is a comparable achievement uh, and is an achievement that reminds us that universality often comes with exclusions and the exclusion of indigenous people from the, uh, the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, but not for you, uh, that that particular uh, doubleness uh, was rectified, of course, by uh, the uh, acceptance, with four, four, four exceptions in the first instance, uh, at the UN, uh, New Zealand, Australia, uh, the States and Canada, of the Universal Declaration, the, uh, uh, the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So the, the, the differential presence uh, of two remarkable international accomplishments by people from this country, uh, that, that shows us we have uh, a, lo a long way to go. And so that the, 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 the discovery of the potential of UNDRIP is part of the process that we're calling rec re uh, reconciliation and the process that we're calling indigenization in the context of our universities. So what the UNDRIP does, it, it calls for resources, uh, it calls for research, it calls for rethinking, but without prescribing their outcomes. This is not the dictatorial demand of the impatient or truculent donor directing uh, what should come. This is not Enbridge talk. Uh, this is an opening up of a new kind of conversation for planning together in both parallel and convergent ways. It is human uh, uh, aspiration, not branding hype. So when we look at the, the parties to academic governance at this moment, the ask yourself about the provincial government's role. It is not to be the fist behind the fig leaf. The Board of Governors role, not to be secretive, coercive fiduci fiduciaries intent on mission creep as with the recent University Act fiasco at this university. Senior in, uh, uh, management, not survival at all costs in the age of the precarious presidency. One of the conspicuous ironies of the moment, I thought that academic precariousness uh, talked was simply another way of uh, identifying uh, the casualization of academic labor across the country. But apparently, the real precariousness is at the top. All those heroic, beleaguered figures who are trying to keep all their fractious faculties together it is the president who is really uh, precarious in this situation. And of course, our flinty hearts should go out to him or her. And the other thing here, faculty uh, should not be there as co-optation or else in the obedience machine. Here is a quotation from Duff Berdell. And what's wrong with it? The role of the university administration is to enhance and protect the academic mission of the university. Fancy that. Who could tell today? Management, the M word is used, but management is used. Management should proceed by using established democratic procedures in the Senate to create con consensus. Not in the co-opted Senate, not in the corrupted Senate, not in the stacked Senate, but in the Senate which has a majority of, of our colleagues in it. 
academic staff, irrespective of status, should use their intellectual capacities and academic freedom to shape the academic mission of the institution in collegial and in collective bargaining uh, contexts. Both contexts are currently necessary. Students should be supported, but not co-opted, in self-governance and institutional governance work, and should act as citizens' information, not as consumers in full bloom. And we need the return of the curious collegium, critically engaged collegial governance, not a court culture with a rubber stamp. Embracing curiosity, uniquely enabled by academic freedom, in a transparently autonomous institution. So the question is, is it the groves of academe or the grooves of academe? For me, the choice is clear. We need ecologies of knowledge and territory, or we have the path dependencies of market logic and administrations succumbing to the allure of the opportune. The treaty or unseated academy and all our relations, or the university means business and public relations. In sum, university governance in the 21st century must not be global corporate, but actively decolonizing and committed to giving students the tools of critical citizenship to use as they choose for their own benefit and the public good. Thank you very much for your attention.